Hey there, Jim Johnson for Accent Help, and I'm wrapping up the diacritics by talking a little bit about some diacritics that I just don't tend to use at all. So quite honestly, I got to get my cheat sheet out to be able to express these because these there's a bunch of symbols here that I just don't commonly use. So I talked about, I'm going to run through really quickly the ones that I do use to help to eliminate them, but I talked about voicelessness. So for example, a Z might get de-voiced, voiceless. Just below that on this chart is the voiced. I mentioned that, but I don't tend to use that one, right? Now, aspirated. So that's one that I will express that something gets aspirated. I don't find it as helpful for accents, but there you go. I did express about the idea of more rounding and also less rounding. I think that's incredibly helpful for explaining a lot of different uh, vowel sounds. I'm going to skip the next two for just a moment, although I'm going to explain some that are on another part of the chart and then jump back to them. And that's where I talked about like the tendency to raise this vowel or how we oftentimes might lower another vowel or even that same vowel in different speech. This being a, an American tendency, this being a British tendency, that that's a common set of diacritics I use a lot for vowels as well. Now I mentioned that you can get also advanced tongue root and retracted tongue root. I don't tend to use those a lot. I used to use them but then, now I'm going to jump back to the order, they for some reason used advanced and retracted, which those then I will use to express that like this is an oo sound moving forward and this is an e sound moving back. Now with that, I think it's helpful for us to look at the vowel chart for a second to remind you how we get advanced, oo, this is the front of the mouth, the back of the mouth, bottom of the mouth, the top of the mouth. Ooh, or e, e, retract it a little bit. You could maybe express those with these, but these are about the tongue root. And then we got raised and lowered. Uh, lowered. Okay, so those are some that I tend to use for vowels. Then we've got some other ones that I didn't tend to use, but one of them, I'm going to skip for a second, it's mid centralization. So like I mentioned that you might say that we mid-centralize the oo sound so that it becomes oo, oo, almost schwa-ifying it. Now if I just advance it, funnily enough, I could instead use these two dots. So that's centralized, meaning moving towards the center. I don't tend to use that very much because I tend to either use that it's advanced, which sort of explains it similarly, or I use mid-centralized because it's crossing down into that direction. So, so I don't tend to use that one, just like I don't tend to use those. Uh, so those are some other tweaks. Then we've got some I mentioned that I'll commonly use like syllabic, like explaining that even though there's not a vowel, this is a syllable. Well, there's also a symbol where you could say end up writing a sound and you actually put a little sad face underneath it, which means non-syllabic. So if you had e, uh, you're saying, oh, this isn't another syllable just because it's another sound. So you could potentially maybe even use it on a diphthong to say, oh, it's not another syllable. It's non-syllabic. That's one of the ways you might use it. I don't tend to use that symbol. I just don't find that that helpful um, in my work. Roticity, I said, we use that all the time with these guys. And this is common usage, and I find it very helpful. Then we got a couple, and I'm starting to get crowded here, but, so I'm going to have to erase, I think. But we've got a couple more that I just don't use, which is breathy voice and creaky voice. So when we get to breathy voice, that's where you could write something like they give the example of, of this with two dots under it, meaning creaky voice or breathy voice. Ah, ah. And I don't find that a part of accents as much. Although it can be a, a language thing, actually, you can get that distinction. Just as you can get a distinction in some languages with a creaky voice. So this is a wavy line underneath it. I already talked about a wavy line in the middle of it in another uh, video, and I'll come back to that. Because we can also get a wavy line above something. Then you get lingua labial. Now we start to get to some of these tweaks of some things happening in slightly different ways as well. 
which lingua labial, they give an example of something like this, which is where it's ling, or sorry, I jumped one. So lingua labial, I never ever use this one. So lingua, lingua, labial, your tongue and your lips. So this would imply that you're actually Britney Spears. If you've never seen it, there's a video of Britney Spears saying all of her L's in her words. So she does them lingua labially. I like because it's so sexy to do it like that. So that's one that I just don't utilize and I don't tend to utilize those either. Then we get to some that I do sometimes use like labialized and palatalized. So this would be where you get labialized, the lips get involved. And then when you get to palatalized, this one's a little Y sound. So this is W, W and Y, Y. So this one, for example, happens in, in Russian accents in general. You get, you get something that starts to get palatalized moving towards your hard palate. So you might say NET, NEVER. You will NEVER, NEVER, NEVER. That transition, you kind of go through a little tiny Y sound. Or a lot of people in theater will teach students utilizing these as transition sounds. Now is the winter, my own. That those are kind of transitions that happen between that aren't a full on W and a full on Y sound. Even though it's a J, it's a Y sound in phonetics. Then we get the couple that I mentioned that I don't tend to use, which is velarized and pharyngealized, because I tend to use velarized or pharyngealized, though you could instead go, oh, well, actually, it's velarized, or you could say, oh, actually, I know that it is pharyngealized, so then you would use it in that way. Um, but I don't tend to use those. These I'll use on occasion. This one I do use a decent bit. And then we get the raised and lowered, which I already hit on. Then we get the dental, the apical, so dentalized. So thing, those things that you might do. Apical, I don't tend to use because that's the way we tend to do it. Take your time. That's the tip of the tongue. So that would be apical. I don't tend to use that. But then we can also get laminal, which means using the blade of the tongue. Don't drink dairy, Dave that kind of moving it to the blade, which I think usually you're doing these two simultaneously. Then we get another one of those wavy lines, the American tendency, for example, to nasalize, I can't stand, which also then tends to raise that vowel, but sort of the unwritten rule is you can't use two diacritics. But that's nasalized, meaning it's the ah sound, but in this case it's ah, because it's going through the nose. So I use that some in transcriptions, but not a ton. And then we've got some other ones that we've used, which I mentioned about aspiration, right? Well, we can get no audible release. And I also talked about how we can get a nasal release or a lateral release, where we get something like button or little, where we release it around the side or we release it through the nose. Those are the diacritics. So I went through the ones that I do use, and then I hit on the ones that I don't tend to use, just so that you've had some exposure to them. But I don't use them very much, so there may be some creative ways that you would use some of these that I've kind of crossed out. If you've got that, please share that in the comments, because I'd be curious about how you actually make use of those if you find them helpful for expressing accents. So that was kind of my worthless video of things I don't do. You're welcome. Whatever. If you want to learn some stuff about accents, you can check out my materials at accenthelp.com. Thanks.